Great. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Experiential Ed Lab. Uh, I'm Ed Kaplan. Uh, with me, as always, is Mandy Stewart. And our <laughs> special guest this week is Joe Peters, who is responsible for this topic. I almost feel like somebody told me that when you retell a joke, if you if you know the joke is going to be successful, you don't tell who told it to you. But if you're concerned about the joke, you always say, and he told it to me. So I feel like I'm saying, and this is Joe's topic, because I'll be honest, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this because it's not um, an area that I have tremendous firsthand experience with. So I'm kind of here to learn here and throw my two cents in as, as just kind of an outside observer. Mm -hmm. And the topic this week is kind of talking about facilities. Um, and Joe, I'm going to let you talk about um, your facility specifically, but uh, I'm seeing this a lot where um, adventure parks go up and then it's how do we add an experiential component? And Joe, you've got experience with the experiential component, more of the educational and struggling to find the right word to describe it. Um, but at the same time, th I think that there's there's a need out there and a, for a conversation on what's going on when um, with this. So with that being said, Joe, why don't you tell us uh, about you and um, your park? Okay, well, to to give a little bit of a foundation to this, um, the majority of my experience in this field is in the experiential realm. I worked with a lot of fantastic organizations, uh, mainly in Colorado, and we worked with groups all the way from elementary school students all the way up to corporate groups, um, uh, colleges and universities and it all dealt with the experiential piece and then just within the last 12 months I came over here the name of this uh, of this company is Trollhagen we're based out of Dresser Wisconsin um, it has been as uh, you may have seen in the earlier pictures that I posted this place has been a ski resort since 1950 but just in the last three years they built a 100 plus element aerial adventure park and then they also have a six line zip tour um, and that's only within the last three years and I came on to manage that facility just last year the uh, the fuel for this for me posing this question and ultimately having this blab here was that the majority the vast majority of our customers of our clientele were here for recreational purposes. I would probably say in excess of 90% were here for recreational purposes only. We did have a few that uh, in in uncovering the needs of what the client wanted, they, they did mention that it was uh, an athletic team and they wanted to just strengthen the bond with the uh, the veteran athletes on the team and the new athletes that were coming on board. There were some other groups that wanted to uh, explore uh, making better leaders out of their group. So there was a very small requested experiential component. And when those people came out, um, they, and I should also mention that all of those groups wanted to add that experiential component on top of spending time in the aerial adventure park or going on a zip tour. Mm -hmm. And ultimately what happened with all of those groups is they would get distracted by the recreational component. I often... Uh, I often referred to this story when people were asking me um, what my experience was with Trollhagen. And what I would say to them is um, when my daughter was very young, when she was six and seven years old, I was the coach of her soccer team. And one day um, at a soccer game, somebody brought a new puppy. And all the teaching and all the coaching went right out the window and That's everybody good. was absolutely fixated on that puppy. <laughs> and uh, so I often call, I often call this uh, the aerial challenge course, my puppy, yeah. because I will bring groups out to do some uh, experiential programming <laughs> and they get completely distracted by the puppy. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. 
Yeah, and I can totally identify with that, Joe, because um, one of the courses that we operate for Northwest Team Building out in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it's in Bellevue, just outside of Seattle, is um, a challenge course that has uh, several low elements um, as well as a vertical playpen and a static high course. And surrounding okay. that static high course is a six and a half line zip tour. I mean, and it literally surrounds it. So whenever we have our zip tour clients going and doing their thing, you know, been around a zip line, you know that it makes a little bit of noise. Uh, and then the people on the zip line typically make a little noise. And oh yes, and, do. and it's sur it's surrounding what we're doing uh, with our educational use clients on our challenge course. So I totally get the puppy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it it reminds me of when it not to the same extent, but when I first started um, facilitating, um, I did work at a course that had both highs and lows. And even though people would be out there on the zip line and, and the high ropes um, for experiential and educational goals, uh, it still was the most distracting thing um, <laughs> it could be. And we talked a little bit about this in contracts is that I would just completely front load the group, you know, because a lot of times we would start before they'd be up on that the high ropes course um, to let them know that, you know, where's your focus going to be today? Um, you know, and, and I think there there are, are tricks with, with some of that stuff, but I, I think it's completely different than now having spent some time at um, adventure parks where those zip lines are constantly buzzing. It's not like for, you know, 45 minutes at the end of the day, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an issue. It's, I can see it as a constant kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, do those kind of things work at all in your guys' experience with the whole front loading that this is going to be a distraction? Um, well, front loading helps. I mean, any sort of distraction or any sort of disruptor in what you're doing, acknowledging that it exists rather than ignoring it is in my experience, always going to be more effective to take the time to stop, acknowledge the thing, and then, okay, we're doing this now. Um, but what's interesting is that <clears throat> even with experiential um, and educational use, it's like the, the low, the people on the low course look at the people on the high course and are going, oh, what's that? And a lot of times if the people on the low course are doing something really visual, say like a giant group juggle, or they're singing their song of accomplishment on some thing, right? The people on the high course stop and go, well, what are they doing? And it's like, it's a, it seems to be a grass is always greener situation, yeah. right? So... Yeah. I think how how we address that um, universally, no matter which direction it's going in, is helpful. Because that's low to low sometimes too. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got a, a low course group, and I'm walking down the trail, and all of a sudden they're singing "Row Row Row Your Boat" on a whale watch, and it's why can't we do that? Mm -hmm. You know. Are we gonna do that um, one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Which I think is great because obviously everything that we do is amazing and awesome. Uh, so clearly <laughs> that's guys, a win. Uh, do you guys know uh, Tony Calabrese? Mm -mm. Uh, he's a guy out of Southern Illinois, uh, the rec department at, at SIU. Um, he used to be up at the team conference in Chicago. And one of the things that, that I heard him say is that whatever we do in adventure education should um, exude uh, – a sense of awe and wonder. So whether we're in a classroom doing something, you know, he's like, we're doing something right when everybody that's walking down the hall looks at that class and goes, what are they doing in there? And I think that does transfer. And I know that part of this conversation um, is, is the bane of my existence as a facilitator because of, and again, that low to low thing of, it seems like every time that I've ever said, oh, well, let's go over there and do that. Um, the group just falls apart. There was a reason I wasn't <laughs> taking them there. And, but again, I'm getting a little off topic here. I want to get back on uh, from low to low to low to, to high. And the other thing that comes to mind is, is there a way to work that into the, the goals for the day with some intentionality? So you had mentioned Joe, like a football team, right? Um, to me, the metaphor that comes up is that that football team is working on something. You got the high rope scores going over, um, how much taunting comes from the other team at the line of scrimmage? How much, you know, from fans, how much going on during the week will, will distract them from um, their, their practice? 
And so to me, mm -hmm. part of it would be is, is there a way that I can create some type of isometaphor that can bring that into whatever the group go goal is? And it's nice when we see those things really easy, but I know that that isn't also a, you know, a cure-all for every situation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I throw it back at the group. Hey, do you guys get distracted back at X, Y, and Z? Um, you know, what are some, tell me about some of those distractions. Mm -hmm. Is this more distracting or is this less distracting? You know, and so that that's kind of sometimes the direction that I would try and um, and take it. So when you thought about this topic, Joe, what were your what were your big um, problems like that that you were thinking about that? Like, hey, maybe bouncing this around with other people might offer some solution. Well, it, it wasn't it was actually twofold. The, the first part was um, I have my puppy. And my puppy is getting all the attention. It's taken from the programming. And to, and to kind of answer Ed's question from a little bit earlier, um, I found it really didn't matter which, which kind of group it was. It could, be, it, could be a, it could be a group of middle school students. As soon as they were put into that environment of this structure that's 50 feet high and it completely surrounds you, um, they were distracted. Some of them were able to return to the moment and, and get re-engaged, but uh, it, it ultimately, only the puppy always wins experience over the year, over this season. Um, um, but that was the first part that I wanted to discuss. The second part that I was hoping to discuss, and we can maybe go back and forth between both of them uh, together is how could you take a facility like an aerial challenge course or like a zip tour and provide experiential programming on that structure? So mm -hmm. instead of trying to avoid the puppy, you actually include the puppy in your programming. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, that is an intriguing and slightly longer conversation now, isn't it? Uh <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think just based off of my experience, it would probably be more, I won't, I won't say difficult, but more um, far away from what we already do to try and do that on a zip tour versus uh, in an aerial adventure park. Because I think that enough people are out there doing creative programming uh, with intention on high courses to where we can translate that to an aerial adventure park environment relatively easily. It's it's pretty close, right? Um, and I would be definitely interested to bounce around different creative programming and, and team-based things that people have done in a high environment um, that wasn't necessarily designed to be a team-based high environment. Uh, the zip tour, I have some ideas on, um, but definitely it's more of a stretch from what we already do. So do you have anything that you already do or that you're like, hey, I've been thinking about this and, and what do you guys think? Ed, you want to take that? You want to start with that one? Well, so I guess that it, here's my here's my gut reaction when you had mentioned this. And part of this is coming off of um, 20 years of experiential and intentionality with goals and find, trying to find those even when I'm realizing the group that I'm working with may not realize that they have goals, but that's the intent of whoever hired them to be there. Um, so to me, the, the first thing that came to mind with this is the staff. Um, does the staff have the appropriate training to be able to facilitate towards goals? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to go for a moment and say, yes, they do. Yes! Thank goodness. <laughs> because, yeah, Mandy, you were like, okay, it's going to talk about that for a half an hour. No, I'm not at gonna, all. I'm just saying, like, that, yes. But I do feel that, that there's training. a disclaimer out there for um, the three of us have interacted individually together before so but for anybody that's just kind of watching the replay of this and doesn't realize that i think that that needs to be just put out there that the staff needs to be trained on how to do the things that we're about to talk about mm -hmm. otherwise we've all seen it probably go we all have horror stories when it's gone horribly bad when somebody has taken a group that's there to have fun and all of a sudden tries to facilitate towards a goal especially in a in a high ropes um 
environment. So, okay, done with that. So what I go with then is having the conversations with starting with the ropes course is looking at it and also talking to whoever your builder was to make sure that things can be done. Like can two people be on a belay cable at the same time? Because if that is the case, um, then you do have the door open to start doing some didactic activities up there. Um, and again, we can go online, we can have conversations with, Hey, what are you doing at your ropes course with an educational program to foster interpersonal communication? Um, even if it's designed with one, just one, Frank, who uh, unfortunately um, had another conflict, couldn't be here with, is he started doing something for communication on his high ropes course, where basically first person would come up to the top, he would give the directions on, I, you know, here's the challenge, if you want to accept the challenge to get from point A to point B, here are kind of the three levels with it. And let's say it's just a, a, a balance beam kind of thing. You know, challenge one is get to the other side. Challenge two is can you get to the other side? Um, in, in the middle, stop and let go with one hand. And challenge three is stop and let go with both hands for a count of five. But then when the next person comes up and says, what do I do on this balance beam? Working towards a goal with a group that wants to work towards communication, he will say something like, someone on your team already knows the challenge. And so that's just one example of, you know, you take the goal, if the goal is communication, of how to take something that is traditionally very individual um, and opening up to that group concept. Uh, likewise, he's done things where he'll say, no one here has to do any of the challenges up top. But before you go up, see if you can come up and accept the goal that as a team, every, every challenge will be taken on. And again, fostering communication, problem solving, you know, somebody says, and also that 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 team view of somebody says, I want to come down. All right, let's just check down. Yeah, you can come down. Let's now that this person's come down, let's check in with the group. How are we with working towards that goal? And again, now we're getting into some of the facilitation. I want to stick on some of the the ideas of how do you do that. Now, that's with high ropes. I'm still thinking about how do you make a zip line itself into a a team building activity. Well, whenever I whenever I'm building a program, wherever it is you know, zip tour on the ground, whatever. Um, I, I have to know the outcome to be able to build that program well. Um, so what get, let's, let's work with a pretend group. Give me a pretend group or a pretend or a pretend outcome that we're going for. And let's, let's roll around some ideas that might work for a zip tour. What do you think? I like it. Give us a group, Joe. Okay. Let me see. A group. I'm, I'm actually going to try and pull from one of the groups that I had out here this season. Nice. Okay. So one of, uh, one of the groups that I had come out, it was a high school volleyball team. And the primary concern of the coach was that 80% of the team last year was seniors and they all graduated. So they were essentially all starting with um, a, a brand new staff, a brand new set of volleyball players. And so they wanted to find out who the leaders on the team were. And that's what mm -hmm. they wanted. That's what they wanted to come out here to discover. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so how many people in this group, like 12, ish there was there was 18 because it was a combination okay. of mostly varsity and a few jv okay all right so at 18 and uh what sort of what sort of tour are we talking about tell me about the tour well that was that was the the group as far as what they they didn't actually go on a zip tour yeah, but in in our pretend future group world where we're uh, addressing this team's needs on a zip tour, um, how, okay. like, how many lines are we working with? What's the braking system? Are they responsible for any of their like safety system transfers or do guides do that? Like what are the parameters we're working with in here? Okay, so we have a six line zip tour. Okay. The braking system is uh, the head rush zip stop. So they are ah, not responsible for any of their braking whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, basically, all they have to do is is get hooked in properly, make sure that they follow the instructions of the zip guides that are with them, mm -hmm. and that's about it. 
Okay, so keep your hands our, off the cable. <laughs> yeah. uh, funny tales, please, ladies. Um, yes. So, are the guides doing their transfers, or are they doing their own transfers? The guides are handling the transfers. Okay, so they are riding the lines. That is what they are doing, and standing. They on are platforms. riding the lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. All right, and about how long now, does the tour take? Oh, go ahead. Something that might also help with structuring some type of experiential component is that um, there is a short hike between all of the zip lines. I've, I've seen some zip oh. tours before where you have a really long suspended bridge that you have to go across to or sometimes you have a vehicle that takes you from one point to another. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of ours, it is it is a hike that averages from uh, a tenth of a mile to a quarter of a mile. Okay. Between each one. Okay. So you have trail time too. That's awesome. All right. You have trail time. Okay. And how many people? Um, how do you actually put people through? Are you putting them through um, in a solid group, like two guides? Uh, one send, one receive, whole group lands, and then whole normally, group. Normally, we like to keep the group size at 12 or less. In a group of this makeup, given the fact that they're trying to create some bonds between them, we would probably keep them as one large group. It would make the tour, which normally lasts about two hours, it would probably now be closer to three because of the larger group size. Mm -hmm. But we would be we would be furthering their goals by doing so. Okay. And extending because if you're extending their actual zip time longer, then the program time is probably it's going to need to be on top of that because we're adding in instructional time that they don't usually get and debrief time that they don't usually get. And then um, yes. I'm guessing that there would probably be more downtime on the platforms than usual and in between. Correct. Okay. Mm. All right. So then those are our problems to solve as far as, um, like we don't want people to stand around and get bored, right? But that also gives us our opportunity to place programmatic components in there too. So there we go. So step one. So now the question to the group is, what can be done on that platform or on that trail that um, essentially gives the group some sort of task or a series of tasks or a problem to solve that would challenge them to put them in those experiential moments that we like, right? Because those are our opportunity points. Now I have some ideas because I've done some stuff, but I'm curious to hear your ideas. You know, the, the go, go ahead. ahead <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <laughs> my, my, my first plan, and this kind of goes back to some un, uh, previously, uh, uh, information that was not given out previously is we do have a small you smattering are just of low like a elements. Client. You are just like a client. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you this. By the way, <laughs> by the way, uh, around around the perimeter of the aerial challenge course are several low initiatives. I have a whale watch. I have a spider's web. I have a tabletop. I have a mohawk walk, and a few others along those lines. Um, so are they? In between, when you're talking about the hike, are they along the path? You can see all of them from the aerial challenge course. And most of them are but within. Like as they're walking, can you take a side trip over to one of those? You could. You Well, no. So there is, those are around the aerial challenge course. And gotcha. none of them, none of them are around the zip tour. What I was uh, in brainstorming with management here at the end of the season, one of the suggestions that I threw out is let's take some of those portable elements and let's move them out onto the, the zip tour. So you could, um, you could go down a zip and then as you're walking from line one to line two, you come across a whale watch and you do some initiatives there and then you move on with the zip tour. So that was that was my main idea, but it sounds like you had some ideas, Mandy, on where we might be able to go with using the actual zip lines or the trail time as a team building component. 
Yeah, and I would say that given that not everyone who has a tour is going to have the luxury of having low elements um, right there, that just for mm -hmm. for our purposes here today of saying, how can we use this thing in a way? Right, because um, really, because yeah. just seriously, because if, no, we're, seriously, if yeah. we're saying, oh, well, it's easy, we'll just walk over to the whale watch and we'll do that. That's so cheating. Right, that's not challenging ourselves to use the zip tour. That's taking <laughs> well, the break from the zip tour to go over and use the use the low course. All right, so um, I would I would approach this if this was my client. I would approach this not as interjecting individual challenges. I would approach it as creating one one ultimate challenge, uh, one ultimate goal that they were trying to accomplish that had um, different components that were interjected throughout the zip tour. <clears throat> and this could be done since your ideal group size is 12 or less, you could actually consider splitting this group in half and putting mm -hmm. half through a segment of your tour and then flip it and put the other half through the segment of the tour. And each group that's doing a portion um, of this challenge, whatever the ultimate components are for the challenge in the air, um, they have a, a different component that they're doing when they're on the ground. So they're always engaged with the overall challenge and goal, whether they're in the air or in the ground, but I think, uh, or on the ground, but I think that um, having those <clears throat> smaller group sizes when we're focusing on um, group dynamics is still beneficial even though we're on a zip tour. So I would split the group in half and build whatever challenge you're doing um, to have ground components and aerial components and consider maybe they don't do every line in the tour to be uh, depending on their schedule. Um, that makes sense? Sure, yeah. you could also yeah, create it so if they did not succeed in a particular challenge they may not get to go down a particular zip line yep but then if there's a part of the thing right the overall thing that we're building toward um that is critical and somebody has to get on that zip line you have to make sure that you're not setting them up for failure too because that's not nice um so unless that failure is part of the success well, that's like blatant, like there's no option for success. If there's a piece that's critical to them completing something and you're omitting that now, so there's no... No, no, that's yeah. not what I mean. What I mean is that they have opportunities to fail and succeed yeah. equally as long as when that failure happens, it's building towards the overall oh, success. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and sure. the, the other thing, so I want to go back to the goals of the group. So we were talking about a group that had leadership, that leadership disappeared. We're looking for more leaders to step up mm -hmm. is kind of summarizing some, some, one of the goals. Yes. And last, last night I spent um, a lot of time watching zip lines on YouTube. Um, <laughs> Don't you and, do enough of that already? <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, I was, I changed over to, looking and one of the things that grabbed my attention last night were a lot of vlogs that people were doing so i mean these are people that are like three buddies that um have just decided to go to a local adventure park for the day and do the zip tour and one of the things that that i think ties in and this is a facil me as a facilitator watching going oh that was a great facilitative moment where'd it go but that's what i'm trying to pull from here is that when you talk about some of the leadership in that um it, the first thing I'd be looking at is and looking to process after the fact is who decided to go first? How did you decide to go first? Is it is that initiative that was taken out of somebody that just wants to get something done versus I'm willing to take it for the team because everybody else is saying, I'm not going first, I'm not going first. And to me, looking for some of those conversations that are organically happening, that that might be a processing point going to the next just the next line and again this is removing any other type of initiatives out of the backpack i want to bring that has my group juggle in it and a tennis ball transfer and channels and all those things because i had to leave that at home mandy uh -huh. um which i think is a good idea for for another part of the conversation well i, w I would then... say that if it's something that's easily acquired relatively mm -hmm. inexpensive that anybody who has a tour could go out pick up 
Yeah. You know, whatever. Then it's fair game. And you can keep it in a pack and not mess up your rescue system. Yeah, because I do want to go back to <laughs> the portable whale watch you have at your course, Joe. Um, but uh, the, I guess basically looking at it is where are the goals and what does this, what does a zip line naturally um, bring out in people? And also, I think that with leadership is sometimes that fear of unknown. If you, especially with the group that we're talking about, um, we definitely see it from maybe the coach's perspective of there's a fear there of do we have anybody on this team that's going to bring up leadership? There is an unknown. In leadership, there is an unknown. Um, are your lines long enough at all that that when you start off, you you cannot see the the landing? No. Okay. Um, so that metaphor is out the window, but that's okay. We can um, have one like but, that if you want to throw out your idea, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> the idea is, is Go with it because yeah. there's there's bound to be a lot of zip tours out there that do have that component. Right. So if if you have a conversation, you know, maybe after the second zip about um, – eh, so here's what I'm doing. As I'm taking some of my low course experience, I work with a group of high school leaders each year. They are going to be PE leaders the following year. And so I bring out either GG cards, postcards, something, some type of symbol-based uh, processing tool, and I ask them to define what leadership is to them. Then hearing what their ideas are, I instantly turn around and look at the course to go, okay, what is it that I can pick today that naturally, back to some of Michael Gass's work with isometaphors, of what can naturally bring out the language that they are mentioning. So in other words, if I luck out and somebody says that they pick, you know, the Chigi card, that's the dark storm. And they mention, I think that part of leadership is going into the unknown. Then this has set me up for a beautiful processing metaphor of, you know, on that last zip, there was the unknown. You, you did go down the zip line though, even though you couldn't see the platform, why was that? And again, the, the, growing up as the son of a lawyer, never ask a question you don't necessarily know the answer to, I'm partially hoping that he's going to mention because I trusted you as the guide. I trusted this. Okay, well, why? Why did you bother trusting? And, and again, trying to maybe start building some leadership conversations off of what's naturally going on. Now, again, I don't have as much experience with the zip line. So somebody that has, does, you know, 100 zips a day is going to know what those natural metaphors are going to be. They're going to hear, just like I heard people say, I don't want to go. I'm scared. You know, on these videos I was watching yesterday, screaming as they go down. Um, you know, guys with, and my favorite is the guys with GoPros that scream bloody murder all the way down. And then as soon as they get to the other side and the guy goes, how was it? Like, I wasn't scared at all. <laughs> There's a metaphor in there, right? Ah, ah, that's fun. <laughs> We don't always have access to go, go pro footage, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think that, and oh, well, there's another thing that you can do too if you have a group or if you have access to technology that, yeah, you schedule an extra time. Somebody had a GoPro, have them film, have them go last and film the interaction that happened before people went down. And then if, again, if you have the technology and sometimes that can just be a cell phone in this day and age to, you know, get down off the platforms, pull over to the side so we're not looking at our cell phones while we're working uh, on the on the course, but then have the group watch that footage and have them pause it to say, here's where I see some leadership going on in this group. And it could be something as simple as somebody said, hey, your shoe's untied. But that could turn into a wonderful conversation on leadership, looking out for each other, supporting the team. Um, and that that moment could be gone. So, and again, tell me if I'm just grasping at straws here because I'm just trying to, to, to you know, apply what it, previous experiences showed me in different situations to potentially in this experience. Yeah, I think all of all of that for the, the debriefing and the processing is really applicable. Um, what my mind goes to in these situations too is not only okay, how is the existing thing that we all have in our brains going down the zip line, um, you know, how does that mesh with their goals? For, for me, if I was watching a team, I wouldn't be watching to see who the leader was that went first. I would be watching this team to see who the leader was that would have been perfectly comfortable going, that stayed on that platform to help everybody mm -hmm. else go. Just, just a thought there. But um, also, uh, my mind goes to what are we doing differently to build and utilize the space um, to make the program engaging for <clears throat> the group B 
beyond just going zip lining, right? So um, a lot of programs that I, uh, I can drop them into pretty much anywhere, right? Um, and uh, so much fun to build. And I do use a lot of QR codes in these, Ed. Um, <laughs> so uh, for the right setting. I've been doing props. I'm giving you props for that. <laughs> QR codes, yeah. <laughs> um, it's um, it's almost like uh, puzzle solving and riddle solving um, to to a certain degree. And some of it very is just blatantly puzzle solve, solving. But it's the the concept of you have to, and not just figuratively have to like do the easier stuff to get the harder stuff, but you have to solve this problem to be able to have the tools and resources that you need to be able to solve the next problem to solve the next problem. Um, and then it all comes together at the end for the final problem um, and the big, hopefully you get it done in time, right? And so there are a lot of different ways that a program like that can come together. And in my ideal world, as a horribly manipulative facilitator, they don't understand, nor can they see exactly how all of these different components come together until the end. Right. So it's it might look like a series of random tasks, challenges, um, puzzles, riddles, whatever. But um, then at the end, it's like, ah, OK, wait a minute. It says this, you know, bring, bring that thing over here, uh, whatever that thing is. And some of the examples of the challenges are um, you have to get to certain physically get to certain places to be able to get uh, clues to be able to solve a logic puzzle, for example. Is everybody familiar with like um, Einstein's riddle, I think is what it's usually called. And it's like super hard logic puzzle that only 2% of the population can solve. There's a lot of 2% of the population stuff rolling around lately. Um, where it's like the the person or the Canadian lives in the blue house. He drinks beer and smokes Marlboros or something like that, you know, was, was the original version. Like there's a nationality for every house there are five houses a person of a different nationality lives in each different house they each drink a different uh, type of beverage they each smoke a different type of cigarette which tells you when this riddle was written it was not any time recently um, <laughs> but um and you get all these clues about like the australian does not live next to the canadian right so you, and then you have a grid where you have to plug all this stuff in um and so when you have um, a facility where they need to physically travel to places or for whatever reason you want to get them to travel to places, you can place all these clues at different locations and then by necessity they have to get to all those locations to be able to solve that logic puzzle. Um, that logic puzzle might give them an answer that then rolls into another piece of the greater puzzle. Be careful with your logic puzzles, though, and how you structure them and who you present them to. I have given the same exact logic puzzle that I made to a group of fifth graders as I gave to an international group from, that had flown in from everywhere from Daimler Chrysler, and the Chrysler people failed miserably. Uh, fifth graders did great. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's... it's so hilarious. So again, make it attainable to get to the next step. But that's like one example. Some I, I do enjoy using logic puzzles and clues to them um, over a course of an area. Um, I also like to, to use physical puzzles um, where there are pieces of puzzles and usually I'll um, custom make them. Um, and although you could just go and buy an actual puzzle from the store, a larger piece puzzle, um, and they have to physically gather the pieces of the puzzle to be able to put that together. Um, I could keep going, but you have a moment, so go ahead. So, well, based on that, uh, two things came to mind. And then also I put a, uh, so I'm going to see your logic pu puzzle and QR codes and see them both. And that's why I put it in the, the um, chat over here is a link to a website that has Zoom as QR codes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you guys have seen that before. So, again, with the logic puzzles, everybody gets a piece. Mm -hmm. yeah, everybody zips line. I mean, there's 32 QR codes. So, I don't know, play with that as you wish. Um, the the puzzle. So, one of the things as you're talking, Mandy, that I come up with is that um, 
and this is kind of where I've mentioned in the past where tweak it, the concept of tweak it has come from for me mm -hmm. is being at a location and having to have team building activities that don't need anything physical. And I'm sure that there, I mean, I can't even remember, and I'm sure it's over on my shelf somewhere. Somebody's got a book that's, you know, low prop, no prop, you mm -hmm. know, team building activities. Yeah. And so that's where I'm also kind of going with is that if you can do a, a hula hoop or a tent pole, actually, this would be a great one for a tent pole because it doesn't take that much room in a bag is do the zip line one shot at the healing at, at, at tent pole. Mm -hmm. And I'll find a write up and put it. Uh, this usually winds up on my uh, blog. I'll put that the link there and I'll get that as a resource. But you know, the helium hoop or tent pole where everybody has to lower it to the ground. Well, in this situation, all right, we've done this first zip. Here it is, one try. Here are the rules, get it to the ground. Next situation. And again, that's one I've used in between low course activities to kind of check in with the group and ask them because usually what happens is they're really close the first time and then it falls apart and then it gets better. Um, great one for talking about stages of team development. But again, it's something that can be in a bag. And again, this fictitious group working towards leadership um, you need a heck of a lot of leadership, whether it's going to be shared leadership where everybody does what they need to do, which again, I see as a great metaphor for a sports team, or you need that directed leadership where somebody on the team goes, stop, nobody do anything, everybody lower it two inches down to my hand here. And again, it's something that would be very easy to put in a bag. And again, depending on your location, get a really nice stick and hide it next to the trail. Um, you know, talking about, you know, something that anybody could have access to, um, let alone, you know, they make portable hula hoops that are, you know, come apart. So that's kind of where I, I went with what you're talking about logic puzzles of is there something that's a traditional um, portable activity that can be broken into stages also? Um, and then giving that try along the ways and again, processing it towards what's changing in the group. And also then I go back to the zip line itself being a tool of is there anything that we're seeing happen with what we're doing with the tent pole, with Zoom, with the logic puzzle that we're noticing is happening before we get on the zip line as a group or when we're exiting? You know, maybe the facilitator or may hopefully somebody, a group member is even noticing like at the first zip, everybody was like eager just to get on to the next thing. And we almost left somebody behind. I mean, not you're not really leaving somebody behind, but mentally we've checked out of the zip line because we're waiting for the next one and we're talking about this and the other. And we've left somebody behind here that, that you know, it mentally needs that encouragement or whatever it could be. Um, you know, I, and you mentioned you have the zip stop. So I saw this so much in the videos last night where people are coming in hot and they either break too soon or they bounce back out and... Mm -hmm. Um, Mandy and I have a conversation afterwards of talking about some of the, the, um, risk management of some of the techniques used, but as, although it's great team building, I've seen how some people get those people back. I think that there's something also to be said of problem solving. If there was that bounce back for some is to say to the group, okay, how are we going to get this person here safely? None of you can leave the platform. You're not attached. How can we do this? And is that encouragement of during our safety training? Hey, remember we do the hand over hand. Hey, can you go out and get so and so that's out on the zip line? What are my resources? What are the things like that? Well, I have and to I interject here that my resources are my staff that are trained to do <laughs> retrievals on my zip tour. <laughs> yes, they are. But at the same time, how many times do groups that this is where the metaphor goes outside of what we're talking about? How many times in a group do we go and try and do something on our own? <laughs> rather than using the resource that we have you know again never been on a football team but the question i'd pose to the the football team if the defense didn't work in last week's game are you as a defense going to come up with a new play or is, are you going to say to the coach hey here's what worked here's what didn't work what are we doing next? i mean that's the coach's job to mm -hmm. a certain point is to come up with these you know who are the outside resources mm -hmm. and again just trying to let my brain go with it as yes, I know that when I'm at a zip tour, somebody doesn't come in, I've got trained staff, they're gonna go out and get them. Well, the goal of the program today is now to pose the question to the team that's at the platform, what do you think we should do? Especially if it is the kind of situation where the person has to go out. Well, we could go out and do this. I'm sorry, guys, that's not safe. I can't let you do that. We could do this. Sorry, it's not safe, can't let you do this. Well, can you go and get them? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Before I go out there, is there anything you're concerned about? And again, depending on how far you want to go, if the aha moment is just asking for help, 
then the aha moment's gotten there. Great. I'm going to go out and get them. I'll be right back. Boom, boom, boom. And again, watching the safety of the person that's out there so that they're not on the line freaking out while the group is trying to decide. All of that stuff to the side for the moment, as we mentioned, there's some facilitation aspects of it. But these are what naturally comes up at the zip line you're running that could be turned into potentially a teachable moment. Yeah, I would say yes and no on that, um, just because there's a very real safety factor that um, gets involved with this, as well as an operational factor. Um, anytime somebody's hanging in a harness, we know that we need to get them not hanging in that harness. Um, pretty quickly because that's good for everyone um, as well as the flow of what's going on on the actual tour. <clears throat> I would say um, just briefly, and every every course is different, like the, the thing that I would consider doing um, from a retrieval standpoint, since you're interested in turning that into team thing is if you have any sort of a hall line system that's approved for retrievals for your zip line or your zip tour that uh, rather than the uh, the guide going out attaching the hall system mm -hmm. and, and then hauling in at the platform to allow the team um, to to do that process for you um, but beyond that just from an operation standpoint I hesitate to um, interject too much into that um, from a programmatic standpoint because of the safety factor. And I completely yeah. agree with you. So I'm going to take it a step further back then. You go down, you go down your first two zips and it's been successful. And again, depending on how your program works, and then you pose it, you know, if you're using that handbrake or some other type of system, you then pose it to the group. Hey, I noticed everybody's come in. We're going to have some zip lines that are a little bit different. I've seen on this next one where people get stuck out there. What do you think we should do with that? Is that going to be, an, you know what I'm saying is I completely understand what the safety aspect mm -hmm. that you're talking about. And by no means would I suggest that. So since that might not be an option, let's bring it back then. So let's put it as a hypothetical to the group, you know, as what would you want to see done in this situation? And again, processing it to the outcome that, that you want. Um, I think that there's still something that could be, you know, again, looking at what is something that commonly happens on this line or at our park, how do we turn that into a problem solving thing for the group? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think we have the, the debriefing portion of this nailed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> metaphors abound. Yeah, good stuff. Ah. So does that answer your question, Joe? <laughs> It did. That gave me a lot of really good fodder. I have to agree. I do agree with Mandy, I, and I agree with you, Ed. Eventually, in that the the facilitator in me loves the idea mm -hmm. of making that part of the zip tour experiential in real time, but the risk manager in me absolutely <laughs> shudders at the thought. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the you know, and the other thing too is I'm looking for this summer. I finally had the my first chance to go on a aerial adventure park. Um, and it was a completely different experience for me, mm -hmm. you know, you know, my first before my training, you know, first day of training, it was you're a participant, get your butt up there, you know, and ever since that time to be able to have that similar experience again is very difficult because we see the magic we see behind the curtain. We're constantly in that risk management you know, role. So, you know, we're facilitators. Even when, if I'm doing an inspection on a course, I still have a different mindset than that participant. So, and just the, well, the final thought on that is that I was on a system I had not had experience with before. So it is interesting to put that other hat on. Sorry, Mandy, go no, ahead. No, no, no. That's exactly where I'm going is why was, I'm curious. I'm like, oh, great. Firsthand information. What was so different uh, for you between high course and aerial adventure? What was your experience that made it so different? Okay, so the first things that honestly we're about is that when I train people around risk management and safety, there's a certain way and certain goals I want to see and that certain ways I want to see them do that. And part of that has always been facilitating towards the understanding of what the equipment does, mm -hmm. what you can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And so my first response was I was just put into a full body harness. And I was attached to the system and I was told, go have fun. <laughs> okay. So um, that was a completely different experience than what I was expecting, mm -hmm. right? So part of it was 
in that participant role of, you know, we talk to the participants all the time, trust the gear, trust this, but we sometimes work with them of, hey, this will hold, if there was a harness that could hold the whole group, you know, all this other stuff, but it was like, go. Um, so I'm going back to your question though, to make sure I'm still answering. So what was different about the experience? That was the first thing that was different. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not gonna say where this course was or anything like that, was that I felt, and this was the trainer in me, is I could feel my shoulder straps wanting to come down. And the first thing I did was I hunkered that sucker down. And the next thing that came up to me, and again, I'm not being a participant, I'm being that trainer, is why aren't you yelling at me to stop touching my gear? So <laughs> now that, that experience, that, is, that experience was the first. Now yeah. up on the course, what was different? Um, why was it a different experience? Man, it's so hard to, to change it because again, I'm going to, I'm used to a two tether system, not a one tether system. Um, I'm used to, um, you know, the mechanics of it being different. So what was different about the experience itself? How did, how did you feel? What was different about how you felt on a high course versus how you felt in the aerial adventure? Take, take the mechanics and the operating system out of it. Yeah. How did you feel? What made you feel differently or how did you feel differently? You know, it's funny because it's coming down to it in some ways not very different mm -hmm. than because I was intentionally trying to do things like, all right, I know this is a Burma bridge. I know how to get across this, you know, from point A to B quick as possible to do a rescue or whatever. You know what? Forget all that. I'm just going to play. Mm -hmm. And and I think that was the biggest difference was giving myself permission to play where the goal was fun mm -hmm. and going back and forth. And again, to the point where, and I'm not sure if anybody else would have this experience on, a, on an aerial venture park, and it was a track and trail system also to give the, the, the visual, is that as a participant, I think at some point I started to have, I started to lose that sense of risk. And I think that if I had not spent the past 20 years on on high ropes courses i may not have had that freedom to go around with um yeah so i don't know in, in some ways uh it's sim very similar in some ways it, different um hmm. um yeah you're, you're making me think about things that i have not thought because okay but this is another thing right you get done that's with your something job mandy that's your job they, but that's the other thing that was weird about it to me, right? I got to the other side, and I was looking for somebody to ask me, how did I do it? I was looking for somebody to ask me, where are you going next and why? So you, you know? just, you, you individually could not flip off your brain work switch. I tried. You could. That's where you were struggling. <laughs> That's funny. So let me ask you We're this. We're going to have to change okay. the topic to we process Ed's experiences yeah. on it. Which makes aerial. which makes complete that's sense. That's a whole new it's... that's a whole new blab. <laughs> that's, you know, that's like a six hour blab and therapy. Because I think I, I made a comment on on Facebook at some point in my past about how like I I can tell you the status of every single utility pole and ground anchor uh, connection from my on my walk from my house to the post office, right? Um, because like we just, you know, that's what we do. So if you were in participant mode, let me ask you this, let's strip away all work stuff. Um, is there anything that you would be able to accomplish on a typical, say, static high course that you wouldn't be able to accomplish in an aerial adventure course? Follow-up question being, what can you accomplish on an aerial adventure course that you could not accomplish on a static, a traditional static high course? Like self-transfer, a kind of situation. Yeah, but that's that'll be changing soon. Um, sorry, that's a whole other topic for another But we're not too. going there on this plan. We're not going there. <laughs> um, so my gut reaction and we'll see after I'm done talking if I change my mind because I reserve the right to change my mind, is that I don't think that there's anything that I can accomplish on an aerial adventure park that I can't accomplish on a ropes course. And people can disagree with me and say I'm close-minded on that, and I agree with it because I don't have the experience. But looking at this one experience, um, 
So the things that came up for me as an individual, I mean, if you look at just the ex cold experiential learning model, I'm not doing this from work. I'm talking as human beings, what we do when we're done with an experience. Okay. I, I experienced an emotion of fear, right? I experienced a getting over that fear, taking that step forward. And what I'm experiencing are a lot of those individual growth points. Mm -hmm. And again, I believe that even if, um, I think this was, uh, uh, I'm bastardizing a quote I heard from Jen Stanchfield, which is, does good processing have to take place if the facilitator doesn't hear the answer? And going further, if the facilitator doesn't even ask a question, sometimes this is what's going on in a participant's mind. Holy crap, I can't believe that I just did that. Holy, you know, I'm going to fall. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Sorry, I always have to welcome new people to Blab. Hey, Bruce. Um, <laughs> so Bruce. Hey, Bruce. Everybody click the, Bruce. The, the welcome him um, so he feels nice and welcome. Um, so I think that part of it is that you, that for those things, what the different experience is, is that it's as the individual. And also as an individual myself, very introspective about those things. Mm -hmm. I have to guess watching videos of other people do it that they're introspective, but of different things. You know, the guy that was screaming bloody murder all the way down the zip line, and I can think see that happening on any kind of uh, high ropes course thing. Um, at the same time, when they get to the other side and say, I wasn't scared, you know, they're, they realize they just told a flat out lie. And I think that the difference is without the facilitation is the, the individual is more apt to make a decision on their own, which going back to some of the things that we've had blabs about with choice in that, um, you know, the, that, that's something to be said as a valuable tool for an individual to make those things and also make the decision of whether or not they're going to, you know, seek additional information. Mm -hmm. I was really scared on that. I didn't like doing that. Am I going to ask my, you know, my date I came here with on this, this high ropes course about that? Am I going to talk to anyone else? Am I going to, you know, go over and have a nervous conversation with the person with the orange backpack on saying, this is really scary stuff. Yeah. And I think that that would be the biggest thing that I can take away from that experience is it puts the ownership completely on the individual of what their experience was and what they're going to do with it. And then all of a sudden I'm dissolving back into the, traditional high ropes course of that's what we're there for. But is that what the client has paid for? When we're in a traditional high ropes course, yes, they have paid for an experience that gets them to be to a different point. There's an intentionality behind that. Okay. Even if it's fun in our traditional ropes course experience, that's fun. There's somebody processing what was fun about that. What made it fun? Was it the encouragement? Was it this or the other thing? When I'm paying for an adventure park experience, I'm paying for fun and I'm paying that this tool is going to give that to me by just going out there and doing this risky behavior. So does that answer your question at all? Yeah. So can we, can we all agree that um, details aside as far as systems and different, um, the differences between uh, like a smart belay system versus uh, a static two line self transfer with carabiners, you know, all that aside, that the big difference in being able to provide that outcome on a high course versus an aerial adventure park is primarily going to be the staffing, right? Oh. And, and putting, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have different staff ratios up um, probably for mm -hmm. um, a facilitated outcome on an aerial adventure park versus um, what you would normally have for a play day. Um, just because of the availability of those people to help um, direct that experience and facilitate that experience, <clears throat> as well as the people who are capable at the end of the day, because I could very, I mean, when you were talking about the, the fear and I had fear and do we need to be there to hear the answer to the question, you know, and those sorts of things, it's what, well, I can totally see and have had conversations about somebody coming off of um, an aerial adventure park experience and they were scared or overly challenged, which can happen on a, a regular, you know, traditional high course too. But the difference in that is that facilitator at the end expecting to help them process that. Where 
the question might not be asked um, when they walk away from the aerial adventure park other than a casual, hey, did you have fun? Was it good? Whatever. Um, you know, they essentially may not have had the opportunity to process through that fear moment walking away from an aerial adventure park environment versus they should have had the opportunity to process through that that fear moment uh, walking away from high course. So that that answer never has the opportunity to evolve if the question is never asked, no matter who hears it. So for those two different things, um, the, the staffing, and again, back to what we said in the beginning, having the staff who are trained to do the thing that they're supposed to do is going to be the key thing. Yeah. Um, but depending on the scope of the of the actual park, right? How many layers? How many elements? All of those things. Um, your actual program, and I'm talking about the structure of the program, not the processing, um, not the metaphors. Um, and the same goes to the zip tour with these things like being really mindful of how are you going to use that space in a very intentional, functional way to meet program structure requirements that help your group be engaged, have fun, and meet an outcome, right? Because the structure of a large aerial adventure park is also extremely different than the structure of a 16 element hub and spoke high course, right? And then, of course, a zip tour. Um, kid, we know that those can come in all uh, shapes and sizes and all sorts of things. Um, so I think that um, I don't know if anybody's done a whole lot of thinking about structure, programs, and components, physical structure, and how you use space and how that affects um, the flow of your program. But for both of these instances, I think that it's critical in planning out um, the overall scheme of things. Yep. There you go. Wow, so that's a great summary. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. I did not intend it to be a summary. It was more like, a, all right, so what are what are our takeaways at this point, right? Um, I think I think overall um, the the structure of the program is going to be way different. It's not going to be the, I don't think the most effective thing is the first we do this and then we do this and then we do this. I don't think that that works with aerial adventure and zip tour the same way that it works in traditional educational use environment. I think that the program needs to be structured differently um, in the ways that I mentioned earlier, as far as like using the space to travel together to build and scaffold into something else. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you, Joe. <laughs> I'm glad I, I can feel be like here. You just really? Wrote, yeah. I when you had first mentioned this, well, a couple months ago when we did the first one, I just was looking at it like I, I'd love to have that conversation, but I have no idea how we'd fill up an hour. We did it. <laughs> and really, realistic, realistically, there's I don't think there's anything that we couldn't talk an hour about, but it's been extremely <laughs> um, eye-opening for me. Um, I know that that one of my goals is even for this year to have more experience in the aerial park industry um, mm -hmm. for multiple personal and professional um, you know goals that I've set for myself for this year. So this is this is actually a very appropriate for me first blab of the year uh, to start thinking about some of these things differently. And you guys have changed my attitude on a few things. Um, you know, if you would have asked me like six years ago, I would have been absolutely not. There's no team building that can be done on a zip line. Are you nuts? Um, and I'd be open-minded to that, but I know that I still am very deep rooted into, if you're going to put somebody in a harness, there's learning that can happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, Yay. So, yeah, this is, this has been good. So, uh, I'm going to do a, uh, let's do a quick wrap up. I'm going to stop the recording and then we'll just hang out for another two minutes here. Cause we all have some other things. So, uh, anything else okay. before I stop the uh, recording from you guys? No, nope, I would I would say that I have lots of actual, like more specific ideas about what can be done with the programming, like actual activities and things like that. That if anybody's interested in like more details, definitely feel free to get a hold of me and we can have a conversation. But it just seemed like it probably get into the minutia wasn't the best yep. idea for this venue. 
So with that in mind, Mandy, if you'd be willing to put your Twitter, Twitter handle in the comments, because there, I know there are people watching this on the replay and just went, yes, I'd love to get in contact with her, but it's a replay and they don't necessarily put the Twitter handles up there. Um, so, and then Joe, you know, one of the things is that we've been talking a lot about your park today. I'm sure that there's some people um, that might be interested in actually coming and being a participant at your course. So if you have a website <laughs> that you want to throw up in the uh, the comments there, um, we'll make sure that that, that stays Absolutely. too. Yep. And then, um, God, what, what link am I supposed to put up there? I'll put it, I'll put in my handle here. The blog. Um, or the Pinterest board. Or, oh, yeah, you know yeah. what? Yeah, so if you go over to uh, experientialed.com and think it's currently called blog, uh, and I'll do experiential ed. And then that'll get links the uh, as long as this is the most recent blab, when you go to the, the blog, that should be the first uh, on that homepage. This, this, this will be there. Uh, and also then there'll be a link in the comments for um, any kind of other resources that we come come up with um, in that. Like last a couple of weeks ago, Joe, you gave me something. I put it up on our resources page for an activity somebody hadn't heard of. So great. Well, thank you, everybody, for watching um, uh, Experiential Ed Blab. Uh, our next Blab, I'm going to promote two Blabs right now. Mandy, while I'm doing this, maybe you can go and grab the ACCT Blab link and throw that in. I can uh, next probably do that. I think it's <laughs> Bitly ACCT precon lab. Yeah, I'm not typing all that out. I'm I'm in I'm in copy and paste <laughs> mode right now. It's been a very busy time. Uh so next <laughs> Tuesday night is the I'm gonna say 19th. Does that sound about right? It is the um, 19th. That is correct. We're gonna have a blab uh, based around the ACCT conference coming up in two weeks. So it's an opportunity. We're gonna have um, some committee folks on there that are um, some of the conference committee. Uh, Mandy, myself, will be there answering questions, talking about uh, what's going to be there. I know I've reached out to a couple exhibitors to say, hey, show up so people can ask questions. Mm -hmm. And just a chance, especially for those of you that have never been to the conference before uh, and are heading out there for the first time, get some maybe some uh, questions answered of what to expect. And then I'm hoping uh, we are going to try and do a blab from the uh, exhibit hall at some point. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So. Uh, watch the, and no, I'll put this one up there, the ACCT channel, because um, that's where that will be announced from, which is just blab.im slash ACCT info. So that's what's coming up. Yeah, and we have uh, no and, idea when we're going to be doing that, but it's totally on the yeah. list of, let's do a blab from the exhibit hall. It'll be great. Yeah, yeah. but if you subscribe, um, and um, then you will get the notifications of when we will be doing that ACCT info. So there's our ACCT channel. So uh, thanks again, Joe, for giving us uh, quite the discussion today. Enjoy your ah, view. My pleasure. Yeah, enjoy <laughs> that great. view. I'm... <laughs> Whoops. I'm not enjoying the view. I'm going out there. All oh, right. God, that's the best way to enjoy it. Then dress appropriately. <laughs> yep. All right. Will do. All right. See you next time. Bye-bye.